As many of you will know, the Graduate Center is the home of lots of pining research, Nobel, Guggenheim, Pulitzer Prize winners, PhD programs that start in anthropology and end in urban education, indeed PhD students who win Pulitzers and Guggenheims, PhD students who teach every year about 200,000 CUNY undergraduates. Tonight marks the penultimate installment of our first 100 days programming, an eight-part series designed to help navigate this unprecedented political era. Conversations over the past few weeks have delved into immigration, civil rights, the social safety net, and other timely issues. And they've all featured Graduate Center scholars and other national figures. I hope you'll join us next Thursday for our final event, moderated by GC Professor and CNN commentator Peter Beinart. It'll provide us with a nuanced perspective of what has happened during the first 100 days and where we are as a nation. This evening, we examine another important issue, whether the administration's approach to trade can bring back jobs and reduce inequality. Many have argued that frustration over the loss of well-paying manufacturing jobs in the US and the widening income gap help explain the outcome of the presidential election. Our panelists will examine whether trade is to blame for the growing income gap and US job losses. They'll also discuss the national and international implications of America's trade policies. David Otter is one of the world's leading labor economists and Ford Professor of Economics and Associate Department Head of MIT's Department of Economics, as well as co-director of the MIT School Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative. In addition, he's a faculty research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and director of its Disability Research Center and a research affiliate at the Abdul Jamil Latin Poverty Action Lab. Brad DeLong is professor of economics at the University of California at Berkeley. He is also a leading research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. As US Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy from 1993 until 1995, he worked on the Clinton administration's budget and NAFTA, among other issues. Anne Harrison is William H. Worcester Professor of Multinational Management and Professor of Business Economics and Public Policy at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. She previously served as Director of Development Policy at the World Bank and head of its research team on international trade and investment. Finally, Paul Krugman is an internationally known economist, prolific author, and op-ed columnist and blogger for the New York Times. His blog, The Conscience of a Liberal, was ranked number one of the, number of the 25 best financial blogs by Time magazine. In addition to being a distinguished professor of economics here at the Graduate Center, he's a core faculty member of our Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality and he's also a LIS senior scholar. And returning to the Graduate Center as our moderator is New York Times columnist and former editorial board member, Eduardo Porter. His weekly economic scene column covers a wide range of issues of trade, the economy, inequality, business politics, and social policy. Recently, he's written extensively about the growth of income inequality and the forces driving it. Please join me in welcoming tonight's guests. Hi, good evening. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, there's been a lot of Sturm und Drang over the last, what, 98 days? Um, today I read that the administration is preparing an executive order for the United States to start the process to leave NAFTA. 
um, which was one of uh, Mr. Trump's campaign promises. And however, over the last you know, 98 days, I've come to realize that perhaps President Trump didn't really mean all the things he said on the campaign trail. Um, he's left China off the hook, you know, not a currency manipulator. Um, his first trade battle was against Canada. <laughs> and uh, the first battle against Mexico, he lost today at the WTO. Uh, and yet I don't think uh, it would be right, of course, to, to discount the Trump phenomenon, and, and notably the tens of millions of voters who actually bought into his argument that immigration and trade have actually done them wrong, have taken their jobs, have weighed on their wages, um, have caused some of the social dysfunction that we now see in many American communities. And so here we've got this group of, you know, pretty remarkable pros um, um, to sort of like talk about, well, is there a case, is there a, um, a case against trade? To what extent is Trump diagnosis correct? Um, is there an argument that, uh, um, an associated argument, is there a case for some sort of protectionist policies in order to protect um, the workers that have been um, displaced from, from, from their jobs or whose wages have not improved due to uh, competition with imports from, from, from other countries? And perhaps, you know, Trump's, Trump's uh, prescriptions have been, you know, pretty uh, outlandish out there, like slapping a 35% tariff against the, second, the world's second largest economy or withdrawing from NAFTA and pretty much undermining the chains of production that have been built over the last uh, uh, two and a half decades um, or even abandoning the WTO. I mean, this, this is something that I would like the, the panel to address, but also maybe even softer stuff, you know, like talking of uh, using safeguards against surges in imports or, or other tools that have been used in administrations in the past. I mean, the, the, our upcoming uh, trade representative it was once negotiating voluntary export restraints with Japan um, as part of, uh, um, um, of uh, as, in a way of using trade uh, uh, protectionism measures to, to protect um, um, workers. So, I don't know, without, without uh, belaboring this further, um, I would like to give each one of, of you guys an opportunity to, you know, basically address these topics and, 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 and get this going. So, if I may start with you, David Otter, who you've written some really important stuff about the impact of trade on, on workers, and your last name starts with an A, so we can do this alphabetically. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, uh, to be on the stage, to be uh, a guest of Paul Krugman here and at CUNY, and I see uh, many of my friends uh, far more distinguished than I in the audience as well. So uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to try to set the stage. I, I won't talk about trade policy per se, uh, but I will try to put it in the context of, of the really dramatic changes in the U.S. labor market that have occurred over the last 35 years. So from 1980 to the present, uh, we have had a period of rapidly rising inequality, and a lot of that rise in inequality is divergence in earnings by education level, and a lot of that divergence is not simply rising wages of highly educated adults, but falling real wages of non-college adults, particularly non-college men, particularly men with just a high school degree or less than a high school degree. A lot of that phenomenon, in, in uh, our, I think our, uh, the consensus understanding, has to do with technological change that has increased the demand for flexibility, expertise, judgment, and creativity, and reduced demand for repetitive physical labor, repetitive cognitive labor. So over the last 35 years, technological change has been more consequential for the changes in the labor market that we've seen. And I think around, uh, you know, up to the mid-1990s, many economists would say, you know, kind of end of story. Um, but the story really did change in the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, and that change had a great deal to do with China's economic development, which, let's be clear, is a fabulous thing from any global perspective. This has been the best thing for the world middle class in probably a millennium, uh, and has created prosperity throughout the world, not simply in China, but in, uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, in South America, in Brazil, uh, Latin America, and so on. So it's been a great thing, um, but it has been extremely disruptive 
for U.S. employment, particularly U.S. manufacturing employment. Now, I, I myself am actually startled when I look at some of the figures. Um, I think many of us have in mind the idea that U.S. manufacturing has been in perpetual decline since 1943. Uh, when it was 38% of U.S. employment at the, at the peak of the Second World War, towards the end of the Second World War. And it's true, if you look at a sh the share of, man of manufacturers, the share of U.S. employment, it's just like down, 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 down. You can't even see the 1980s recession. You can barely see China's rise. But if you actually just look at the number of U.S. manufacturing workers, you'll see something really remarkably different. So in 1943, at the end of the Second World War, there were 16.6 million U.S. manufacturing workers. In 1979, there were 19.7. In other words, not that much change. By 1999, there were 17.3. Again, not that much change. And then between 1999 and 2007, U.S. manufacturing employment fell by 3.5 million jobs. And then in the subsequent three years, between 2007 and 2010, it fell by another 1.5 million jobs. So 5 million jobs lost almost a third of all this U.S. manufacturing employment. And that's a really traumatic shock. It really falls off a cliff. And this does have a great deal to do with the rise in competitive position of China. It's not a fault of China. Uh, it's the nature of uh, all of a sudden we have a, 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 a very competitive, low-wage, high-quality country making high-quality goods that are a better deal. Consumers start substituting towards them. That raises consumer welfare. It makes lots of goods and services cheaper. But it, it, it has a very concentrated impact on the places that make those things. Manufacturing, by its very nature, is very geographically concentrated. So we're talking about commodity furniture to going into decline. We're talking about Tennessee or South Carolina. When we're talking about textiles, we're talking about the Carolinas, we're talking about Virginia. So 5 million jobs in a labor market of 150 million people really isn't very many. But when it happens in a few places and all the industry, all the manufacturers in one place go under simultaneously, it, ha it has a, a seismic impact. So there are diffuse benefits and concentrated costs. We've always known that that's true in theory. And in the 2000s, we really saw it play out in practice. And I think it's understandable that people have, uh, you know, do feel like this was unexpected, unwelcome. Uh, they were not warned. They were told trade is a win-win. And it didn't work out as expected. Uh, Brad, if you, if you would take from there. Um, certainly, I've learned a huge amount from David Otter. And certainly, I've had to revise substantially upward my own beliefs about the negative consequences of the China shock that hit the United States economy starting in the late 1990s as China's industrialization shifted from something that was impressive for an extremely poor country to something that was of world historical importance. Um, but I would like to put his talk, his remarks, a little bit in perspective and also to erase what I think might be somewhat of a misapprehension. That is, when you talk about the number of manufacturing jobs going from 19 million to 17 million over, you know, up in the years from 79 to 99, those aren't the same, it isn't, those 17 million jobs in 1999 aren't the same 17 million jobs that existed 20 years before. There's been enormous churning within manufacturing and enormous regional shifts as well. Um, that my grandfather had to close his shoe factory in Brockton, Massachusetts in 1933 at the peak of the Depression and move up to a place where wages were even lower, South Paris, Maine. The workers of Brockton, Massachusetts were kind of killed by this, especially as this was the point when the rest of southeastern Massachusetts manufacturing centered around textiles was beginning its major move down to North Carolina. Um, it was a bonanza. The Lord Brothers Shoe Company was a bonanza for South Paris, Maine until 1947 um, when they hit the wall again and the brothers took the capital and split up and headed off to become real estate um, developers in the Sun Belt and elsewhere. Again, jobs that did oh, say it wasn't a big shift in terms of the types of people employed. The Lord Wellman Construction Company, which built turnkey phosphate and other chemical plants in Florida, employed very much the same kinds of people as the Lord Brothers Shoe Manufactory in South Paris, Maine. But these were people in Florida rather than people were in Maine. So there's always an enormous amount of churn, and that's the reason that I think looking at the share, which shows a relatively smooth decline, um, is more insightful than looking at absolute numbers, 
which seems to say things were stable for a long time and then they collapsed. That what's actually happening is that jobs are opening up and closing in the economy at all times and people are moving and shifting about. And so looking at the long share decline tells you that what's going on is a very long, ongoing, and remarkably constant process interrupted by occasional big shocks that produce large short-term changes. And how large those short-term sudden shocks are, how distressing they are, depends on a bunch of other things going on in the economy. To just throw out some numbers, um, we were never going to have 38% of the non-farm labor force in manufacturing. That's only if we're spending all of our time building bombs and tanks. Um, the post-World War II normal was about 30%. If we just had, if the United States had been a normal, industrialized, global north, rich, powerhouse country like Germany and Japan, by now we'd have gone down from 30% to 12%. Now we've gone down further below 12%. We've gone down from 12% to 9.2%, and I would attribute that decline from 12% to 9.2%, because... Um, the United States has followed very strange macroeconomic policies, policies that have made it a savings deficit rather than a savings surplus country, policies that instead of having the United States as a rich country finance the industrialization of the rest of the world, have had us acting as kind of um, a money laundering center, a risk, you know, a political risk insurance provider, a place to put your money because if the balloon goes up in your country and you have to flee in the Learjet or the rubber boat, um, it's nice to have money at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, and if you want to avoid being subject to the tender mercies of Christine Lagarde at the IMF, it's nice to have lots of dollar assets in your government's hands. Then from 9.2 to, I'd say, 8.7% because of the rise of China. Um, from 8.7% to 8.7% because of NAFTA. NAFTA is a nothing burger as far as manufacturing employment is concerned. And from 8.7% to 8.6% because of the bad trade deals we've made with China, with Mexico, with Canada. They've taken us to the cleaners, I tell you. Over three generations, they've taken us to the cleaners. Bigly, they've taken us to the cleaners, of course. And of course, that extra 0.1% of the labor force of extra manufacturing jobs we have shed because of our trade policy, which I would distinguish sharply from the general rise of China and sharply from macroeconomic policy imbalances and definitely from technology, that 0.1% of our employment has had brought with it powerful countervailing advantages in other sectors. Great, Dan. Um, so is trade not it? Trade you know, red herring. Well, let me just step back for a second and try to negotiate between these two men to either side of me. Um, so Donald Trump won the US presidential election by convincing voters in states like Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, that he would make America great again. What was his platform? And if I may say by convincing three million fewer voters. Yes, okay. Let's recall that he didn't win the popular vote. Um, he promised to impose 20% tariffs on imports. He promised to build a wall uh, to keep out Mexican immigrants. He promised to renegotiate now, possibly throw out NAFTA. It, on Sunday, we saw an almost repeat in the French first round of the presidential elections. Um, Marie Le Pen made it to the final two on a far right platform. Part of her platform is to take France out of the European Union. So the question we wanna ask ourselves are why are these anti-globalization themes so appealing? I'm gonna throw out my own numbers, okay? Since 1984, when we had 25 million manufacturing workers, okay, half those workers have disappeared from manufacturing. So we've gone from a country where we had one in four workers was in manufacturing to one in 10 workers is in manufacturing. Okay, the reason, one of the major reasons why that's important is that those are actually quote unquote good jobs. So if you, in my research, what I do is I follow a worker who's kicked out of the manufacturing sector and moves to services. Typically they'll lose 5% of their wages, the same worker. If that worker leaves manufacturing because of a trade shock, 
you can show that that worker loses about 15 to 20% of their wages, that same worker. So you're losing jobs and you're losing good jobs, okay? So the, the important thing is the pain is real. Um, and so what we're seeing is we're seeing a shrinking middle class, we're seeing stagnant wages, a lot of those stagnant wages for less educated, middle-aged workers, and we're also seeing an enormous surge in inequality, higher than we've seen in the last 100 years. Um, in addition to that, and this is very important, we're seeing a rise in insecurity. People, even people who still have jobs, they're afraid for the future. They're afraid about where their kid's gonna get into college. They're afraid about whether their kid's gonna get a job at all. They're afraid of, that they're gonna lose their job. That rise in insecurity is really important. So then we have to ask ourselves, somebody like me, an economist who always supported free trade, did we miscalculate the gains from globalization? I think we actually made two big mistakes. The first mistake we made is we thought it would be really easy for people to retool and find a new job. It turns out that's not so easy. We have a record number of people who have left the labor force. The second mistake that we as economists and policymakers made is that we thought it would be easy to compensate the losers. The idea it, behind globalization is the winners, the exporters, the consumers are so much better off that we can take some of those gains and compensate the losers. So that didn't happen. Our package for helping the losers called trade adjustment assistance basically only helped about half of those it could have helped. But I think really much more important than that is that really Americans don't want handouts. What they really want are jobs. So that leads me to the next question. Is barricading ourselves against China and throwing out NAFTA the solution? So this, this is where Professor Otter and I are going to deviate and where I'm going to support my former Berkeley colleague. Us Berkeley types stick together. Mm -hmm. um, and I think China, to be perfectly honest, is a convenient scapegoat. It reminds me of Japan in the 1980s when Michael Crichton described a yellow menace, very racist, in his novel, The Rising Sun, and I think that's what we're facing now. So why do I think protectionism won't help? I have a new book called, interestingly, The Factory Free Economy with a co-author in France named Lionel Fontanier. And I want to tell you the story in the very first chapter written by Richard Baldwin. So if you go down to South Carolina and you go into a textile mill, the only thing you'll see is a man and a dog, okay? The dog is there to protect the machinery against other people. The man is there to feed the dog. So what that tells you, really, and this is just an anecdote, is that China is not the enemy. The enemy is the machine, okay? So let me give you more facts to bolster this claim, and this is where I'm gonna support my colleague um, from Berkeley, okay? My own research has tried to decompose what has happened to manufacturing jobs, and what my research shows is that maybe 10% of that is due to firms going offshore. Three quarters of it can be attributed to the fact that the cost of machinery has fallen and firms are basically substituting people for machine. Let's go back to the long run trends here. Okay, if you look at the last 50 years, 50 years, way before China came on the scene, the share of manufacturing value added in GDP has stayed completely flat, okay? Hasn't changed at all. What has changed very gradually is the share of manufacturing workers. And here, again, I would agree with my colleague to the left, I don't see a big chart decline at around 2001. There is a decline, but it's not big enough to offset the trend. You see a gradual decline in the share of manufacturing workers. So how can we have a constant share of manufacturing value added in GDP, whereas the number of workers in manufacturing, the share is falling? The reason, again, it's machines. It's rising productivity. Machines are replacing workers, okay? So let me just summarize. The pain is real. The solution is wrong. So it's not that winter is, co is coming. It's that the robots are coming. Can I, I just want to make clear I, I'm not advocating uh, trade barriers of any sort. Uh, that, that, that may have been what you took from our remarks. But I'm just saying the China phenomenon is real yeah. and did have a very large effect. Yeah. That doesn't mean we should 
try to turn back the hands of time. I'm sure Paul will want to say more about this. Okay. Um, so I, I'm actually going to, um, instead of arguing with my fellow panelists, I think I'm going to argue with myself a bit here. Um, so, but let, let me give you two propositions. Uh, one is that economists were much too complacent uh, about trade um, in, in, in the fairly recent past. Um, and second, that everybody is way overreacting to trade now, which are not contradictory positions, but I think we need to have both of them in there. So there was a kind of late 90s consensus about the trade and, and the economy, um, which was that, yeah, actually trade was a contributing factor to rising inequality, but a very distinctly secondary uh, factor, and if you did the numbers right, it really wasn't that big a deal, and and we should really be focusing on other programs to, you know, basically we should be focusing on inequality and trade was not the issue. Um, and if you had to ask, you know, who's guilty of that sort of, uh, what turns out to have been a, a, a bad position, I think probably the prime suspect would be me. Um, that I was, I was making that argument. I was making it because I was taking pretty standard trade models, looking at the actual volume of trade and saying, look, you, it's just not big enough to be telling, the effects that people are, 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 are attributing to it. Now, a couple of things happened. Uh, one was that the, in fact, trade went up a lot. And I would say it's, it's, it's partly China and it's partly, it's not just China. We actually had a distinct change in the character of trade. If you take a long time series of, of trade as a share of world GDP, you find you know, there's a big dip in the interwar period, a gradual recovery about 1980. It kind of looks not that different from 1913. And then something happens, hyperglobalization. There's this takeoff of trade, this breaking up of value chains, and it's extraordinary. And China is the leading edge of that, but it's it's not just China, and a lot of it is coming. So trade becomes, so we, a lot of the estimates that said trade can't be that big a deal were from data from sort of 1993, and guess what? By 2015, uh, trade with, with low-wage countries is a vastly bigger thing. Um, and then there is the specific um, falling off a cliff thing of, of, the, of the 2000s, which is partly, now partly that's a statistical illusion because the rate of growth of the labor force slows a lot. Um, the baby boomers are all in the workforce, women who are, uh, the movement of women to paid labor is over, so what has been a, a more or less continuous declining share in manufacturing turns into an actual drop in the number of manufacturing workers, which it wasn't before. Um, but there was also, there was a big move into trade deficit during the 2000s, which was, um, you know, f uh, a lot of it emerging market money uh, flooding into the United States in the wake of the Asian financial crisis. So, you know, everything in economics is connected to everything else in at least two ways, and it's this funny backwash from, from that. So, you, trade becomes a much bigger deal um, for much of the previous, of the last decade than it was. Um, so, and then the other thing, which is something that I really do kick myself for missing, is what David uh, in particular and co-authors have pointed out, which is that um, workers are a lot less fungible, a le lot less mobile, a lot less able to shift locations and so on than, 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 than we like to imagine. And so, because, um, ex because manufacturing industries do tend to be geographically concentrated, when you get a wash of stuff, you have communities are gutted in a way, it's not, you can't just think about workers as if they were all the same. The fact that all the, all the export-oriented workers in some town in the Midwest have lost their jobs matters. So the effects are bigger. On the other hand, there are, it's, it's a dynamic economy. Stuff is always happening. There are, and some, uh, it's funny, actually, I used again, uh, in a column recently, the, the number 75,000 uh, people lose their, Americans lose their jobs every working day. And I got some internal mail from the Times from people saying, that's ridiculous, that can't be right. That would mean that 20 million people yeah. lose their jobs every year. And yeah, 20 million people lose their jobs every year. It's a, it's, as an economy, it's a lot of churn. Things are happening all the time. Um, as uh, you know, more, more retail jobs were lost in the last two months than, um, than the number of coal jobs lost since 2000. Uh, stuff is always happening in the economy. Um, manufacturing, because of the geographic concentration, may matter more, but there's, but, and, and, but also 
disruption of manufacturing centers. This is something I'm actually just learning from Brad now. That is not a new phenomenon and it does not have to be related to international trade. Um, if you walk around uh, Broadway and 7th Avenue right here, you'll actually, there's even a statue of a garment worker at his sewing machine. There are lots of signs about the history of the garment uh, district and, and you know, there is no garment district here anymore. There's just memories of a garment district. So that disappears and it's not unique in that. Um, but, and now here's where I, I'm not even sure where I come down in terms of how we deal with it. Um, trade, um, we can do the numbers, we can go through the objective, the realities, and say that trade is just one of many factors that causes disruption and causes, but it always has a psychological significance that's much bigger. The fact that foreigners are involved always makes people emphasize trade shocks much more than they do corresponding shocks that are coming in. The people, people get upset about the disappearance of steel plants in a way they never got upset about the disappearance of the buggy manufacturers because it's just somehow it's, it's foreign as the sense of unfairness. And to a little bit, I think economists have a reverse problem, which is the comparative advantage, the proof that trade can be benefit everybody is one of the pride and glory things of our profession. And so we emphasize the good side of trade more than we should as well, which leaves us in, a, in an awkward position. Um, last thought, I'm not offering any answers here. If we think that the answer is a stronger social safety net, better compensation, think about the fact that France has a welfare state, a social safety net that is beyond the wildest dreams of American liberals. And nonetheless, Le Pen came in, uh, made it into the second round of the election. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, just a word in defense of, of David and, and, and China. I was, I was, my last column for the paper was about whether China should have been labeled a currency manipulator in the last you know, 15, 20 years. And I was speaking to Brad Setzer of the Council on Foreign Relations International Economist. And he said that there was a before David Otter, Dorn, and Hansen, and an after David Otter, Dorn, and yes. Hansen. Yes. Because of your work identifying the local impacts of of uh, ch competition from China. I just, I just want to say, I wrote multiple columns saying China is a currency manipulator, which was true in 2010 and 2011, mm -hmm. but is not true now. Exactly, exactly. But, uh, but anyway, I think part of this conversation should also be, well, there's a, a supposedly there's a set of, of, of actions that the Trump administration has promised to take, you know, about NAFTA, about China, even maybe about the WTO. So perhaps we should consider what would be the cost if trade is, at the very best, overblown as, as a cause of, of a lot of this dysfunction that we're seeing in the economy and in the labor market, what would be the cost of some of the actions that the Trump administration is proposing? Abrogating NAFTA, for example? For example. Well, I'd say full NAFTA abrogation, returning us back to 1992, would cause a world of hurt to the American automobile industry, among others that the argument of the anti-NAFTA people, Ross Perot on the right and my labor friends on the left, was that the American auto industry was in the crosshairs of competition from Mexico in 1992, and if we went forward with NAFTA, Detroit would suffer. Sherman Robinson of IFPRI and a bunch of others have, I think, convincingly demonstrated that simply wasn't so. What happened was that in one of the first creations of integrated global, sophisticated global value chains, the American auto industry after NAFTA managed to reconfigure its work processes so as to shift out the bad, low-paying manufacturing jobs. Those in which people are essentially robots in the production process because our machines aren't quite good enough. While keeping the high-value, skilled, and even semi-skilled parts of American manufacturing, and that without Mexico there as a potential resource to draw on, Detroit would have had much, much harder time competing with German and Japan auto manufacturers than it actually does. And if you abrogate NAFTA, that kind of goes away. And General Motors and Ford and Chrysler are in a lot worse position from a business strategy division of labor global value chain perspective than are Toyota, Honda, Subaru, Nissan, BMW, Mercedes, etc. So I, so I haven't, I, we don't, I don't have an estimate of what Trumpist trade policies would do because Either we don't, does he. That's right, yes. well, because we don't even know what the policies are, but, um, but let me give you a, a parallel. We, there, there's been a fair bit of work on Brexit, 
Uh, and you know, we, we have a better idea of what Brexit w w will actually involve, and you can plug that into standard trade models, uh, and which are, of course, largely uh, exercises in boring science fiction, but still, uh, we can, and, and it, but if you try a, a Brexit estimate suggests something like um, that that would, in the long run, will make Britain about 2% poorer which is, and you know, in a way there's a slight dirty little secret of, of international trade modeling, which is that the, the benefits from trade and the costs of protection are not trivial, but they're not nearly as big as the rhetoric would sometimes lead you to believe. So, and something like, you know, depending on what it would be, but it's something like an abrogation of NAFTA, you might want to think of it being something like that. However, here's where the order point comes in, in cutting exactly the opposite direction, which is that we have now, you know, NAFTA is not a new thing. We have a whole industrial structure, which is an integrated North American production system with, with a, a, a piece of, a, you know, a, um, a, a car that is finally assembled in Ontario is going to involve stuff that takes place all over the continent. Um, and you would be abruptly disrupting that, and, uh, um, which would produce exactly the same kinds of disruptions that the China shock did. And so, it, 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 people have heard this in the green uh, the, the, the old joke about the motorist who runs over a pedestrian says, oh, I'm sorry, let me fix that, and backs up and runs over him again. Uh, it would be an extremely disruptive thing, because these are, the thing is, all of these trade, the big changes in trade are a little bit, they're a bit in the rear view mirror now. The China shock is pretty much something that ended, uh, uh, you know, around the beginning of the Great Recession. The, the uh, NAFTA, the big changes from NAFTA ended even before that. So now we're talking about taking an established industrial order that's based around a lot of trade and unraveling it with disruptive effects. Um, guys, um, so folks are going to come around to collect the cards if you had any questions, and so the cards are going to be brought forward here so we can ask the panelists. I don't know if either of you guys wanted to jump in here. I'd be happy to. Because if not, I'll just go first. Um, yeah. sure. no. okay. Okay. So let me try to bring this around to this question about sort of trade, automation, and so on, which is something that Anne correctly emphasized. So over the longer run, I think I, something I also said uh, initially, automation has been more important. Uh, and going forward, it's likely that automation will be more important again. The China shock was hugely disruptive, but it, it's, it's much closer to equilibrium now. With no change in policy, we won't see anything like what we saw over the last 15 years, over the next 15 years. Um, but uh, we ought to learn some lessons from this. One is about the social safety net. As em emphasize, our trade adjustment assistance policy is woefully inadequate. But I think the, a deeper point is, you know, jobs have their own value. You can't make someone whole. You know, if someone said, hey, Paul, you know, what if we just, you know, we're just going to give you a bunch of money, what you would normally earn, and then just you, your identity is gone. You're no longer an esteemed economist, right? You're just, you're retired. You would go, would you say, oh, great, I got all this money. I don't have to do anything. Like, that's a better life. Of course not, right? For most people, their work is, you know, central to organizing who they are, how they perceive themselves, how others perceive them, their social identity. It, so we don't. Just having a better social safety net is not really sufficient. We would like to actually have good jobs. Um, there are other ways to go about that. Actually, tax reform is an important part of that. The whole border adjustment tax idea was basically a Trojan horse for value-added tax, which most of the countries that we interact with have. And that value-added tax treats imports and domestically produced goods symmetrically. Uh, whereas our current system places a lot of tax on things that are produced here and only sales tax on things that are imported. So moving towards a better form of taxation could actually be uh, beneficial for investment and for returning profits to the United States. Uh, similarly, uh, we could uh, continue to invest in the things that make us innovative uh, and actually create a lot of good employment, as we have historically done. We should be concerned about manufacturing, not just as a jobs program, but because as a center of intellectual innovation, where a lot of our patents and a lot of our R&D occurs, and that creates a lot of wealth, and it creates a lot of jobs. We'd be a much poorer place, uh, and we're going to be a poorer place if we cut the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health, if we stop investing in our great public universities. Uh, so we're really at risk uh, of making that mistake and, and making it really severely. Um, the one thing that I, I want to disagree with, or 
or at least caveat, I, I don't think we should fear the robots per se, which I think, or at least that's how I heard it, maybe that's incorrect. I, automation has been with us, uh, you know, for 200 years. It has made us lot, much wealthier, much more productive. We lead, you know, safer, more interesting, longer lives uh, at much higher standards of living because of all the advances we've made. It's also disruptive, like trade. It doesn't tend to happen as fast. We are in an era where people are very concerned that automation may all of a sudden change a lot of things very quickly. So far, that hasn't happened. It hasn't happened at all. In the time since 2000, you know, the US has added 15 million jobs between 2000 and 2016. That's about as many stories has been written simultaneously about the robots taking all our jobs. Uh, it's, it, and in fact, the productivity data also don't support the view that we're in the middle of this technological surge. We may be, we may be an inflection point, but it hasn't happened yet. We should again be preparing for how we benefit from the complementarity, how we benefit from the greater productivity. Uh, it's coming, uh, and in fact, we wanna make sure we're making the robots here, not buying them from China, not buying them from Germany, right? We're gonna be using them 20 years from now, so we'd also like to be making them. So, we want to think about how we take advantage of these opportunities, uh, not how we make them go away. Um, and I, I mean, I also wanted to, uh, to raise this issue that you could argue that there's too few robots around because the productivity statistics are really not looking very good. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say a couple things about what would happen if we transition to a more protectionist state. Actually, I just want to make two points, really. One is that 95% of the world's markets are outside of the U.S. borders. So as a company, as a worker who works for an export company, anybody who wants to tap into the world has to think about the rest of the world. So closing in is not a good idea, even, even from a business perspective, which that's something that Trump understands. But the other point I want to make, and to me this is even more important, the two billion poorest people in the world, the people who live less on less than one dollar a day, on less than two dollars a day, they live outside our borders. And it's the people in the rest of the world who have benefited a lot, particularly the Chinese, from, from opening up to trade. And we have a prominent um, a, not, a prominent writer sitting in the front row here, Bronco Milanovic, who has written a book that's very important that shows that even though inequality in every single country is rising, global inequality is falling. Why is that? Because the poorest country, in particular countries like China, have been able to use access to world markets to catch up. And I just don't see how we can turn our back on two billion poorest people in the world. So that's what I wanted to say about the, the cost of protectionism. I wanted to say one more thing about the, the hard part really is what do we do going forward? And I want, it would be great if we could discuss um, a proposition that has been made both by Bill Gates, who I think of as more middle, and by someone who is quite on the left, Anthony Atkinson, who died recently, and who wrote a book on inequality. And before he died, he wrote these 15 points about what should be done. And both Bill Gates and Anthony Atkinson, coming from completely different perspectives, one an Oxford or Cambridge Don, the other one a billionaire, are suggesting that what we should do is we should either tax um, uh, machines or find other ways to promote labor intensive growth. Okay. That's a terrible uh, idea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, actually, there, there are two things I want to say. First, I just uh, we have to say about the robots. Actually, uh, you, you, in, in saying don't fear the robots, you are kind of missing the sky that kills us all. But the, uh, um, the no, but the. Um, let me actually, let me put that one on. So I, I, Anne's raising a point that I I very much agree with, and I'm not sure what to do with it. Which is that it, it, if we 
step back from a U.S. perspective, step back actually from an OECD perspective and, and take a, you know, a ruthless cosmopolitan global perspective, then this, all of this hyper-globalization thing has been an incredible force for good, and it's not just China. In fact, in some ways, China is, that's the old story. You want to be thinking about the ones who are further along. Um, I, I spent a little while looking at Bangladesh, which is, you know, if you go to Bangladesh, you're horrified. It's incredibly poor, terrible conditions. They have industrial disasters that make the Triangle Fire in the United States look like, a, like nothing. And yet, they are a country that was literally on the edge of starvation when they achieved independence and are, have had, really, had more than a doubling of per capita income. And it all depends on the ability to export labor-intensive manufactured goods. It's basically, as, as somebody said, they're not a banana republic, they're a pajama republic. And, it's a, uh, uh, and, that, and so that is terribly important. That's a reason why these open markets. And yet, can you imagine trying to run a U.S national campaign saying, look, we know that a bunch of you guys, are, your communities are being gutted, but we've got to keep these markets open for the sake of the people of Bangladesh. So I don't know how we deal with that. And it's, uh, it don't, I actually really just don't know the answer to that. Well, well, I'd love it if we could think a little bit about trade policy into the future. Uh -huh. Is there a role for changing trade policy, for reviewing trade policy? And I'm thinking both in the domestic and in the global perspective. So on the domestic side, you've got even folks like Larry Summers, hardly a crazy radical, writing pieces about how we should rethink the institutions and we should think of trade deals that focus on different things, more like you know tax evasion and labor rights and stuff like that. Like the and, TPP, actually. You know, <laughs> certainly. Um, and, 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 and from the global perspective, I'd also like to... The issue that globalization has helped a lot of countries move up from poverty um, is, is certainly true, but now there's this kind of questioning of whether it can still do that. So you have the work of folks like Danny Roderick, who wonders whether you know manufacturing, uh, uh, the manufacturing economy will be able to do the trick that it did for countries like China. That whether China may be the last country that's able to use the development strategy of export-led industrialization to a complacent country willing to be the importer of last resort and so build its communities of engineering practice. Well, I would have said that... Huge that, question. Everyone should go read Richard Baldwin's new book, The Great Convergence. About yeah, this. I mean, actually, I, I do remember. We, well, this, one, it, this actually ties in a little bit. We used to say, I used to say, when, when we had the original gang of four newly industrializing Asian economies, we used to say, okay, you can do this, but you know, how much labor-intensive production is there in the world? It's, how could this be possible you know, once China tries to do this? And it turns out it was possible, and a lot of that, I think, but has to barely. do... Yeah, but well, barely. Well, but it was possible because we slice up the value chain and, and we take stuff and create labor-intensive segments of the production. And so far, I mean, as I say, I think Bangladesh is still, there are, few, there are a few countries behind China in this, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and so on. Um, but it's, there may be limits to it. And also, you know, well, part of the thing is that it, for some reason it doesn't seem to work everywhere. Why, why is Mexico, in fact, leaving aside the whole, you know, NAFTA is evil and all that, but why, why hasn't Mexico actually had the takeoff we would have expected it to have? Well, I, guess I think one thing that it's our job to do as academics and economists is to very proudly fly our rootless cosmopolite freak flag <laughs> whenever it's appropriate to fly our rootless cosmopolite freak flag. And to say that a century from now, people will be writing that one of the glories of the American age was precisely that the United States did not regard it as its business to do as much as it could to retard. Um, the growth, development, industrialization of the rest of the world, and that in fact prioritized rapid industrialization, development, growth, an open economy, a liberal polity. That was one of the things that's made the era since 1945 so great, rather than an era in which America is constantly losing. I find myself wondering something that Pascal Lamy said in the conference I was at last November, quoting the sixth Chinese Buddhist patriarch about how the wise man points at the moon and the fool looks at the finger. Um, that there was a Hungarian Jewish sociologist 70 years ago who said that a market society was bound to destroy itself because in a market society, the only rights you have are your property rights. And your property rights are only worth something if they give you control over things hard to reproduce that help in making things rich people have a serious Jones for. But people believe they have much more rights to property rights 
Um, the way that Polanyi put it, people believe they have rights to land, to the stability of their communities. People believe they have rights to their labor, that because they've done the right things and work hard, the market owes them a good job at a solid standard of living. And people also believe they have a right to finance, um, in the sense that the financial flows necessary to keep the particular firms they work for open and functioning should not be suddenly withdrawn at the sudden hint of Sir Lust for Profit of some sinister bunch of gnomes of Zurich who are probably rootless cosmopolites as well. Um, and that this is a huge problem. That you know, people believe they have much stronger rights than simply those provided by property rights. A market society only gives property rights. And yet when you try to move beyond a market society to social democracy, we move to a safety net which produces large-scale welfare programs, which people then hate. You know, back in the 1920s, welfare was a good word. When Edward Filene wanted to fight socialists in the United States, he said welfare capitalism, in which firms provided their workers with all of the health, pension, safety, other unemployment insurance, disability benefits that firms did was the way to go, thinking that welfare, incorporating welfare to capitalism made it much more acceptable. But because people don't want handouts, they want respect, over the course of the past century, the word welfare has been poisoned um, as well. And dealing with this is one of the major political, economic, rhetorical challenges of our time. And as an economist, I want to throw this over the side somewhere to sociologists and political scientists. David, you've been itching to go in. Uh, sure, I, I just wanted to say a little more about why I'm not in favor of taxing robots. Uh, <laughs> Uh, ro robots are, it's, it's not like carbon uh, pollution uh, that creates global warming. This is, you, you, this is like taxing things that make you more productive. Imagine if we said, well, we should be taxing computers because you can displace all these clerical workers. We should be taxing cars because all these farriers and equestrians and so on were going to be displaced. Uh, it would have been a terrible idea, not only in sort of making us poorer in the short run, but making us poorer in the long run by retarding investment and innovation. And then in a globalized world, we would actually, we would tax them and then we would buy them from elsewhere. Did you just say it was totally a bad done. idea to tax cars? I did. For external. Uh, for, no, uh, but uh, we do. To, to tax do we them, miss, to, to, do we treat miss? Them, yeah. to treat them specially di differently. I, I think our, t our tax system favors labor over capital in an unfortunate way, and they should be treated symmetrically. Right now, all this you know, rapid expensing and so on is actually a poor idea. But to single out an area of technological advance and say we're going to punish it uh, because it could be disruptive is, uh, is a way to make ourselves poorer over the long run. And so, I, I will especially, I want to reiterate the point, robots are going to be a really big part of production. Uh, we actually have had a technological advantage. A lot of the technology started in the United States. They're now migrating elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be investing in that as a country, like we have done in so many other technologies as a, at a societal level, not you know, uh, waving goodbye uh, because we don't, we're afraid of what it might do. So we used to have, what, 500,000 women working telephone switchboards, plugging cables into boards, and now there's nobody in the United States who says, gee, I wish I could get my grandmother's job at the telephone switchboard at Con Ed. Gee, that was really such a great job. That was a job that took a human being um, a, with a very sophisticated brain capable of everything a hunter-gatherer does and everything built on top of that. And just because it's a supercomputer fitting in a bread box drawing 50 watts of power says let's use it as a robot. And a massively underuse it as a robot as well for an eight hour shift. Well, that's interesting. I mean, if I had to think, part of the question is what is a robot? And uh, is, a, is a machine learning algorithm that makes, that now, these days makes you know, Google Translate startlingly good. Uh, is that a robot? But uh, and are self-driving vehicles uh, robots? Because if I, if I wanted to think about a technological change that could displace a lot of workers in the fairly near future, we have something like five million people who are basically drivers, um, professional drivers, and that could go away in a heartbeat. And my, but on the, on the third hand, fourth hand, uh, amongst my hands, uh, the... Um, but, but the, um, but the opt long run optimism about the effects of, of technology not, is, is history bears that out, but the long run can be pretty long. Looks like, it looks as if real wages stagnated for about 40 years during the Industrial Revolution. And 40 years from now, you know, 
Uh, a lot can go wrong in 40 years. So, so I mean, th th there's an interesting point that something that this conversation was focused on manufacturing, but the automation and whatnot is making inroads into the service economy, um, which is, you know, employs a lot, lot more people. I mean, software is a much bigger deal than robots already, and it probably will continue to be, right? Software is the hamburger they ate the world. Um, so anyway, it's time for, for, we've got like 15 minutes for questions. And um, I, I wanted to start with this, uh, it seems like a, a great topic for you guys to take on. It's like, you know, that it, the popular discourse assumes that service jobs are, are and always will be more poorly paid than manufacturing jobs. But that isn't inevitable, is it? So should we maybe think as the future, the future, you know, and, 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 and put the resources and the efforts of government into ensuring that the service economy provides, you know, high quality jobs with good wages rather than focusing on how many manufacturers. I don't think services send many of the way to partition it. Um, if you ask me to partition it, I would say that there's the people add value by using their strong backs, but that started to go out with the domestication of the horse. And people add strong, add value with their nimble fingers, but that started to go out with automatic textile machinery. However, because every horse and every steam engine and every spindle and every automatic loom and so forth requires a microcontroller. Human brains had added an awful lot of value by being microcontrollers for what was replacing them in terms of moving big things around and doing nimble matter manipulations. And also there's a fourth category, call it accounting. All of this keeping track of stuff, who owns stuff, spreading out information of stuff, organizing stuff, um, that that was a huge boom as well. And the problem is now that robots proper are about to get rid of the microcontroller jobs, indeed have gotten rid of the microcontroller jobs, with the guy with the dog in the factory. And the accounting jobs, the kind of basic white collar, you, this form you haven't filled out correctly. Um, you know, even the graduate admissions committees that could be better done by an algorithm um, <laughs> than by. Um, well, no, we that's we, we do know that, 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 yeah. that uh, uh, live job interviews uh, make a fundamental contribution. They destroy a lot of value added. There's a lot of evidence now that, that yes. interviews are terrible. Seen this, you've seen this for a long time. You've seen economists go on job markets and people have long records of what they've done, and what they've worked on, and what their advisors and their peers say about them. And that gets you an interview in a hotel room for 30 minutes with five people. And then that then wipes out all previous information. Um, and then after that, you come and give a seminar. And the seminar then wipes out all but, previous but information. Can I just interject? I think what Eduardo was asking about was not service sector, yeah. serv which is 80% of employment, everything yeah. from software to hospitals, but s personal service jobs, service occupations, helping, assisting, and caring for others. Personal services, and social engineering okay. jobs. But, so those um, are rapidly problem. growing part of employment, and they are low-paid jobs, and they're low-paid in every advanced economy. Sheryl Sandberg does not have a low-paid job. She's not a personal service. Sheryl she's Sandberg not, she, is a social okay, engineer so, organizing wait, job. You added that word. I was talking about Food service, okay. cleaning, security, home health aides, right? Makes up about 14, 15% of employment. These are very low wage jobs. They're intrinsically low wage because they use a generic skill set. You can be productive in many of those jobs within a couple of days without a lot of training. Because labor is not intrinsically scarce for them, it's hard for them to be high wage jobs. They tend, wages tend to rise at about the rate of economic growth, but they tend to stay at the bottom of the ladder. You can cause there to be higher wages in those jobs through subsidies or through regulations, as is done in Europe more so, you will tend to have less of them. It's, it, is a re, it is a very challenging problem. Except um, um, healthcare jobs include a substantial number of middle class jobs, jobs that, and, and uh, um, I, I've, I've been a little obsessed uh, last you know, basically since the election with West Virginia, which is, uh, uh, is interesting, you know, obviously went three to one for Trump because he promised to bring back the coal jobs. And the f there are no coal jobs in West Virginia, right? It's, a, it's about 3% of the workforce now. 15% of the workforce is healthcare and human services, um, which it includes, of, you know, some of those are low wage jobs, although it's not clear they have to be, could have more labor unions, many of them are not, they are in fact, uh, and those are, the, those are the jobs of the future. I guess, uh, I'm not sure, if, I've forgotten who wrote, but you know, if you look at the, the 12 
uh, occupations that are predicted to grow fastest in the United States over the next 15 years, basically 10 of them are, are nursing in some definition or other. And, and nursing it can be, isn't always something, but it, it, so, so it's, not, it's not inherently the case. Services is a hugely, you know, services is everything from hedge fund managers to, uh, to janitors. And, it, and, and some of those can be middle class jobs. And, and, and here we get into things which go beyond, you know, if, if, uh, if Walmart had been unionized, which could have happened in a different yeah. political environment, we'd be looking at a quite different uh, uh, landscape in terms of, of wages in the United States. So everyone needs a personal shopper and information provider. Everyone um, needs a personal shrink. Everyone needs a personal trainer and a personal life coach. And that's employing half the population right there. Well, you know, why, why, at, at some level, if you, yes. look, if you had gone to, uh, if you'd taken a physiocrat uh, someone who believed that all true value is created by farmers and portrayed a modern America where we have, uh, uh, I think the, the, the comparison is there are fewer farmers than there are people playing World of Warcraft. Um, that, and say, you know, what, 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 everyone must be doing complete make work that's, and that's basically not true. Um, here there's a question about unions, which you just brought up, and I, maybe if I could broaden it a little bit, but what kind of institutional changes do you think could help improve the quality of work going forward? I mean, you guys have sort of like decided that the safety net isn't going to do it. Um, um, uh, trade policy seems like not the right way. So what, where, where's a policy set that has some traction? And if I could just throw into this question a little bit the arguments of, of David Weil and the, the fissuring of the workforce um, that, I, that we haven't talked about, but I'm wondering whether it might even have a bigger impact than, th than you know, whatever impact trade has had and an impact as, of a, as large a scale as, uh, as technology, this idea of changing business norms and you sorting off workers by their you know, marginal productivity and you know, the, guy that, the janitor that used to work for GE and somehow benefited from the fact that he was a GE employee now works for a janitorial subcontractor rather than for, and, and is, is kind of like relegated to a much more cutthroat labor market than it would have been in the past. Yeah, that, I mean, that, you know, we don't know until we try it, but I, I'm, I'm uh, the decline of unionization, which in, sitting in America, we said, well, that was inevitable. We, you know, manufacturing shrank as a share, and so we have virtually no private sector unionized workers, but that is by no means universally true across the advanced world. Uh, uh, Canada still has, I think it's, it's well in excess of 20% unionization. Uh, Denmark, I think, has something like 70% unionization. Um, that's, there, the, a lot of it had to do, I think, and, you know, this was an argument one could have, and, and, but had to do with the political environment. During the, the reason that Walmart, which is our biggest employer, does not have a union, whereas General Motors did, is a lot of it is that Walmart became the biggest employer during a time when the legal environment, the political environment, was extremely hostile to union organizing. So if you have things like card check, you have things that just make a, a sympathetic case, uh, then, then it's possible you can change this. They, 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 there's a lot of reason to believe that there's substantial wiggle room, that the wages are not pinned down by marginal productivity to nearly the extent that Econ 101 says it should be. Is that enough to sustain the kind of society we want in the face of, of the robots? I don't know. Um, all right, so here's, uh, we, you guys didn't talk about education, which is surprising because that often comes that up in these sort answer. of discussions. Uh, uh, but there's a question about, you know, how about spending more on reskilling? Is that like, uh, what, what part of the... Package? Well, so, I mean, education is, is, is the most important investment we've made over the long term to adapt. Right? If we, you know, uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, when agriculture was sh shrinking, uh, very rapidly, the farm states sort of got out in front of us. They said, look, we have a whole generation of kids who are no longer going to be needing, needed on the farm, but they're not prepared for industry. What are we going to do? Well, what they did was they mandated that everyone stay in school until age 16. And that was a radical step because not only did you have to build those buildings and hire those teachers and buy those books, but those kids couldn't provide labor to the farm while they were in school. It was extremely expensive. It was an incredibly forward-looking action. It gave the United States the most productive, the most flexible, the most skilled workforce in the world in most of the 20th century. Uh, and it didn't happen automatically. It was a societal choice. But if you, if you imagine taking the labor force of 1900 and plopping them in the 21st century now, 
many of them, despite their you know, strong backs or good characters, would not be employable because they would be innumerate and in many cases illiterate as well. So we have made our, kept ourselves relevant by educating ourselves. That's not a panacea. It doesn't mean it solves all the problems. Inevitably, not everyone, you know, if you need 25 years of education, that's 25 opportunities to not make it, right? There's a, it, it, it's challenging, but uh, we have fallen behind in this. We're about 14th in the world in getting people through post-secondary education. Uh, and we used to be first in the world. I don't want to say make America great again, but uh, we are, we are under-investing there. Yep. Uh, and the way that we're gutting our, our great public universities and colleges is particularly tragic because this is something we've done really, really well. And in many parts of the world, public universities are somewhat mediocre, and that has not been true in the United States. Can I concur with and endorse everything David Ottawa said and strengthen it? Um, especially looking out at people who are thinking that maybe they might give money in some future time to Columbia or New York University. My view is don't. It won't work. That's not how our private universities work. Back in the 1950s, Harvard educated 1,200 undergraduates a year. Um, Yale educated um, 800. Now Harvard has received $30 billion in private gifts and has grown its class from 1,200 to 1,600. At a time when the University of California has grown its classes from 4,000 to 50,000. Um, if you want to make a difference as far as education is concerned, it's organizations like CUNY that carried the serious load back in the days. When Harvard and Yale had hard Jewish quotas of 10%, and given the way that our privates are set up, they are unlikely to use their gift money wisely at all in the future. Um, I should mention, we did have an event with Raj Chetty here, uh, who did a study of systems that actually do produce major upward mobility, and it's public schools that do it, but they do it in varying degrees, and there's one public university system that is completely off the charts at success, and it's us, it's CUNY. Um, there's, there's a, we, we, I think I have time for one more question, and there's a question here about what's the role of a minimum wage, maybe I should have rolled that in with the thing about union, but again, I'm looking for margins on where one could you know, change for the better. Yeah, minimum wage is clearly something that we can do that, that you know, won't trans transform the situation, but a higher minimum wage will, will make a, a big difference. And I have to say there, uh, it's, uh, I, there is no subject in economics that I know of where careful empirical work has done more to change people's minds than on minimum wage. I mean, we, uh, uh, you know, people occasionally dig up things I said 25 years ago about minimum wage and, and how it lead to higher unemployment. And, not, and, I, and they say, why do you say something different? And the answer is, well, because Card and Kruger and Dubé and all these people have done this incredible work. And it turns out that the evidence is overwhelming that when minimum wages are in the vicinity of where they are in the United States, there is no discernible negative employment cost to raising the wage, clear poverty reduction, clear improvement. So minimum wage by itself is not but it's to, to transform, but it's one of those things that uh, one of those things we really do know how to do, and we should d just be doing it. Um, minimum, I mean, there, there's a slight question about the $15 wage, um, which is fine for New York City. Is it really okay for Alabama? Uh, maybe not, but, but a big push on minimum wages, definitely. Can I ask you to say that to David Card, that it's changed your mind? Because he was lamenting three weeks ago that I was the only person who'd told him that oh, it had God. seriously changed his mind. No, I always say that. This is nothing... Nothing, okay, you can tell him this. There's nothing, nothing. I, I mean, I, I, like, I like to be open-minded, uh, but this is something where it really, um, shockingly good work, and it just, and tur it, it turns out to, you know, uh, it, it moved me sig significantly left on labor market policy in general, because it says that, that you can do much more than, than I thought. And it created a great mystery, because somehow it seems that employers have massive amounts of minor market power at the low end of the labor market where you really would think they would not. We, we have another, another good policy tool in this realm as well, which is the Earned Income Tax Credit, which makes work pay better at the margin. It's had uh, positive effects on labor force participation, earnings, and poverty reduction. Uh, in 
female-headed households, it's almost unavailable to men who can't claim dependence on their tax forms. That doesn't mean they're not fathers, by the way, but they're uh, not in a situation where, and so if you're a, a mother of uh, two, single mother, you can get up to about $6,000 in wage subsidy per annum through the EITC. If you're uh, a father of the same age, you might even have two children, though they're not uh, your dependents, uh, you can get about $400 a year. Um, the, the greatest, the group that is experiencing the most dramatic declines in employment yep. uh, and falling wages are low educated men. Expand and that's my fault. In 1993, in 1993, we had to get the Clinton Deficit Reduction Plan below 500 to 500 billion in deficit reduction, and the expanded EITC for childless workers was the last thing that we at the Treasury threw out of the troika as we were being chased by wolves. Well, it, it's an idea that that it, that's it's still a good one, and but it would be expensive, and and you know the, the minimum wage appears free. Uh, because you're imposing the cost on employers. The ITC, you're going to have to raise revenue to pay for it uh, in a world in which we actually have... Free. Yeah, the minimum wage is free. You're reducing a monopolistic competition okay, so deadweight I, I loss. By the way, let me, let me just say, um, there, there is a tone, I mean, which I've been very guilty of here. We, we, we worry about the politics. We worry, we talk about the very hard to do stuff. Um, but if you actually look at you know, how did safety net programs uh, work during the Great Recession? How successful were they at limiting the rise in poverty? Uh, I, I have to have taught that in class this morning. And it, the answer is incredibly successful. We, we weathered this terrible economic crisis with obviously lots of suffering, but increase in child poverty was negligible. Uh, increase in adult poverty, not quite so negligible, but you know, it turns out that we actually do have the tools to make life a lot better. Now, do we have the tools to convince voters who actually benefit from these programs that they should vote for the programs and not vote for, but that's another issue. Well, yeah, we haven't done that. I mean, we're, we're, our, our public taxes to, to GDP has been 20% like since yeah. the 60s as it's right. grown but by still, leaps and bounds other countries. still three million votes, right? Three million votes. But in California, you know, you can run it up in California, California anytime, you know? Yeah. Okay. Those weren't the real America, so anyway. <laughs> and let me, make a plea. let me make a plea for UBI. Okay. Um, that the problem is you have to sell it as something that isn't welfare. Yeah. Right? That after Bill Lord moved to Florida and became a real estate um, speculator and a construction company employer, he actually hit it quite rich and at one point was the richest man between Tampa and Orlando. And ever since then, the money from the Lord Trusts has been flowing to me and has kind of boosted my annual income and consumption by about $10,000 a year over the course of my life so far. Um, but now it's over. And I don't see of this, but I don't see this as welfare. I don't see this as making me a loser. I don't see it as an offense against my dignity. Even though, you know, I had nothing to do with his accomplishments, and you might well argue he was grossly over-rewarded from them. Similarly, Mitt and Ann Romney don't in any way feel that they are loochers, losers, moochers, dependent, because they had stock they could sell when they went to school at Brigham Young and so could actually eat better meals and actually have remnants on the floor of their basement apartment, which people who didn't have stock from their fathers to sell did not. The problem with UBI and the welfare state is all one of presentation and perceived desert, as I will tell you, as someone who does not in any way feel I'm a loser as a result of income flowing down from the family, and as Mitt Romney and Ann Romney would tell you if they would step back and reflect a little bit about where their position in society came from. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, sorry it ends so soon. <laughs>